as Derek said earlier, all of us are here because we're looking for other answers. Um, <clears throat> let me tell you a little bit about my journey. I'm traditionally trained as an internal medicine doctor, and uh, my first day of practice was January the 2nd, 1977. And so I had a great first 10 years, and then the music died. And so I practiced another 24 years. Um, and someone asked me, so well, why did it take you so long to change? You had 24 years. Well, the answer is there was no place else to go until I found out about age management medicine, which I came to um, as a patient and then as a practitioner. And then um, what I've become to realize over the last seven years that I've been doing practicing age management medicine, that uh, it's allowed me to practice internal medicine. So I think um, how many people here are, are practicing and trained uh, in primary care, if you don't mind holding your hands up? Okay, so, so a good number of us. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, we love uh, what we're doing. And um, so in order to be able to do what we love to do, then um, sometimes you have to look and think outside the box. So in terms of framing the discussion today, I want to pose some questions and hopefully we'll have the answers to all of these at the end of the session today. And um, first of all, what is the current initial clinical assessment of the age management patient? Uh, there was a recent Cochrane review pu published uh, last year in the uh, British Medical Journal that was a meta-analysis of 183,000 patients ages 18 to 65. They were followed in clinical studies from 1 to 22 years. And the question was, what is the value of the general medical exam? And the conclusion was, the general medical exam as traditionally structured had no impact on cardiovascular or cancer mortality. The study did um, tease out the fact that uh, a, an exam focused more toward preventative issues, especially a detailed, extended conversation with the patient is, is of still significant value. Um, you know, when you're in primary care and you're seeing two patients every 15 minutes, it's very difficult to do a detailed uh, discussion of their medical history. Uh, the second question is, how has the clinical evaluation evolved over the last several years and where is it headed in the future? Third, what diagnostic tools do we have available to evaluate and monitor our patients in age management and medicine? And I'll go through shortly our evaluation process. Now, our goals are, of course, we still are doctors and we still are practitioners and, and, and that's our primary training, it's our primary interest in this profession. So we're still interested in detecting the presence of disease. We're certainly not going to ignore it. Determine the patient's individual aging process. Uh, you know, we look around, especially at ourselves and our, our colleagues and our patients, and we all see that we age at a different rate. Thirdly, we want to determine what we can do to alter the future. So once you've had um, clinical experience and training, you know, it doesn't take um, an astute clinician to see when someone is on the path and they have a 40-inch waist, they're 5 foot 10, they're 200 pounds, um, they have a family history of diabetes, we know where they're going to end up. And then finally, we all want to be back to optimum performance. Um, and that, I think, is the main uh, difference in terms of thinking from traditional medicine. We're trained to uh, de re restore hemostasis, homeostasis, and restore normal levels. What we're talking about is restoring optimum levels, and I'll explain later about what that means. So in our evaluation, uh, we want to collect as much data as possible because we're not limited because we're in a cash-based practice. We're not limited by, um, by third-party payer guidelines. Our data collection is going to be passive and active. Um, we're going to evaluate as many biological parameters as possible. The other things that we want to do, um, as uh, Derek mentioned earlier, is identify environmental factors. And that's one thing that we really don't do very well in traditional medicine. We more importantly want to identify obstacles to success. Um, and and this, this concept, it, for me, was very different uh, when I 
left traditional medicine and started practicing age management because the obstacles to success are in many times motivational, behavioral. It doesn't have anything to do with the dose of high blood pressure medication I'm giving a patient. But then, of course, we want to offer a customized solution because patients are coming to us many times because they're not finding the answers in traditional based medicine. So the first thing we want to do is look at history and our lifestyle assessment. Now you notice I didn't say history and physical exam. That comes later. The key components uh, initially are the data collection. So I want to know what is that patient's age management goals. And we do this ahead of time in our center. We actually send the patient a 25-page history form that they complete before I ever see them. Um, and I review that. And um, my job the, the day of the exam is I spend about 30, 45 minutes with that patient reviewing the history form and teasing out more information. But more importantly, I want to know what are their expectations? What are their goals? And then, of course, I want to know their current medical problems. I want to know what medication they're on. Um, again, many of our patients are looking to get off of their medication. So if they're on the statin, they don't want to be on the statin. They want to be off of it. So what are my realistic uh, expectations of being able to accomplish that? Uh, supplements, uh, uh, just about everyone now takes supplements. The problem is they're not the right kind, they're not the right quality, and uh, they're not the right combination. And then I want to know about allergies and food intolerances. Because one of, my, one of the key components of my prescription is going to be nutritional changes, dietary changes. And I'll need to know about those food intolerances ahead of time. And of course, past history, you want to know about injuries, surgical procedures. It's amazing um, how many people uh, don't include that. Uh, and, and as in internal medicine, you know, we, we're not very good always at, at determining what the past medical problems were, and especially those problems that would interfere with the, the, our goals. And then I want to know what have they tried in the past? What have been their failures? What are their successes? And then more importantly, I want to know in their mind what time in their life they were in optimum health. And sometimes I'll even ask them to bring a picture and look at and see what is optimum. So uh, to me, this is optimum here. Okay, that's optimum for me. Um, so I would encourage you to bring your, have your patients bring a, a picture of, of them when they were in their uh, period of time they were in the best health. And then finally, I want to know about family history, because that's going to allow me to predict the future. It's also a hot button. You know, many times uh, patients tell me, you know, my dad was a diabetic. He, he um, developed kidney failure, and I don't want to go down that road. So I want to know what their hot buttons are, because that's, I'm going to use that to help motivate them. And then I want to know if, based on that history and based on their previous uh, treatment, uh, what additional evaluation am I going to need to do uh, beyond, well, I need to do a heavy metal screen, for example, or I'm going to need to do food allergy testing. And then, of course, we're going to do an extensive review of systems looking at uh, all their major, uh, major organ systems. And then in terms of mail, um, many of our patients, um, it's interesting the number of male patients we see who are going through a life-changing event, usually a divorce. So I want to know uh, what their marital status is. I want to know about their sexual history. I want to know if they've been on a history of performance enhancement. Um, I want to know, especially if they've had any previous screening and lab results, tests done, ask them to bring that information. And then more importantly, what is their relationship with their sexual partner? You know, we see patients who uh, say, you know, I'm, I'm, I want to get in better shape. I'm going through a divorce in six months. And I say, well, does your wife know that? No, but I want to get ready for the divorce because I know after the divorce I'll be dating. Um, and then, of course, uh, measurements. We're going to take a look at height, weight, size, body alignment. We're going to test all major muscle groups. We're going to look at flexibility and balance because these are the evaluation of the mus muscular skeletal system is a key component for us to be able to uh, achieve the results we're looking for. So uh, what we do in our center is um, in that fitness assessment, uh, we'll, of course, take measurements, body weight, but body alignment. Because um, I want to know about the biomechanics. If I'm going to be writing an exercise prescription, I need to know, 
Do they have poor quad strength? Do they have some body alignment issues? Because if I create an exercise program that's going to accelerate or aggravate a, a pre-existing problem, uh, I'm going to probably lose that patient. Okay. So uh, I'm also going to look at, through a, doing a DEXA scan. Um, I'm going to look at body composition. I'm going to look at fat, lean muscle, and bone density. Now, what we see in terms of fat distribution in our center is the average uh, initial male patient, total body fat is 38%. Optimum, um, we consider below 20%. Female, it's about 10% higher, 48%. Optimum for females, below 25%. The other things I want to know is not just what is the total body fat, but what's the distribution. So that um, in the typical male and female patient that has a lot of belly fat, they're usually about 10 to 11 percent higher distribution of uh, android belly fat compared to total body fat. Um, in women, so I want to know uh, in women especially what the breakdown is because women nutritionally and exercise is much more challenging. Lean muscle. Um, I want, not only want to know what, in, especially in men, and women, what their previous optimum was for them. But what's their current lean muscle status? Were they previous athlete? Uh, so, so this is going to allow me to uh, base my exercise prescription on what their realistic uh, body composition 